Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2014, our top secret research and DVD production compound with another Watchman video broadcast. We're going to take you back to ancient history. We're going to go way, 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 way back to the days of Windows 95. Some of you remember that. I do. Windows 95 was the first operating system in the Windows series to be barely able to get on the internet with a modem. You remember that? Remember those days? Modems? Modulators and demodulators, little devices that you had to plug in uh, to the, uh, the, the PCI slot of your computer. You had to configure it. You had to load the drivers. You had to plug the telephone cord in it. Remember those days? And then you had to put in all of this stuff, or if you were lucky, your, your internet service provider had a little disk for you, and it would set up all the configuration settings for Windows 95 to get on the, to get on the uh, information superhighway that Al Gore invented with his algorithms. But anyway, 1997, this was in the days of Windows 95. IBM develops uh, this massive, super duper, high speed computer they called Deep Blue. I think I have like one of those in my hand now. I mean, we're talking old technology. But anyway, IBM develops this computer they called Deep Blue. It's the, the, um, the predecessor that came after Big Blue, which was before that. They invited chess grandmaster Gary Kasparov to play chess with this computer. Now, we explained this, the difference between what Deep Blue did, what quantum computers are able to do right now, or they think they're able to do right now. But this Deep Blue computer had the ability to look five, six, seven, eight moves in advance, uh, to run out all possible scenarios in just a few seconds. I mean, it was the fastest thing anybody had ever seen in 1997. Kasparov wanted to go along with it because it was pretty much known amongst the grandmasters of chess that at some point, computers were going to be able to surpass human beings in their ability uh, to play chess and their win. Now, uh, take a look at this. This is a uh, Newsweek cover, The Brain's Last Stand. You see a graphic here. Kasparov with his head in his hands. Guess what happened to him? Kasparov had his head brought to him on a charger by this IBM Deep Blue machine. This computer kept winning and kept winning and kept winning. And the more the more that Kasparov tried, the more frustrated he get. I was reading about this just last night, uh, and it basically said Kasparov. By the time he played that last game, he had lost everything. Not just the chess games; he had lost his dignity. He had lost his spirit. I mean, this computer was beating him, and he knew it. Kasparov, being the grandmaster and the competitor that he was. Decided he wasn't done. He don't like to quit. He don't like to be beaten. He's going to figure out a way to win. That's what chess players do. They think. They think on if they get beat once, they remember it. They're going to try to figure out a way to not get beaten again. And that's what Kasparov did. He invited a guy by the name of uh, Topolov, another Russian grandmaster chess player who wasn't quite as good as Kasparov. Kasparov had already beat him in a previous match four to nothing. Okay, four games, Kasparov wins, Topolov wins, a goose egg. Okay, but here's what they decided to do. Both players, Kasparov, Topolov, decided to team up with a computer. So I want you to get this, this idea. You have Kasparov and a computer. You have Topolov and a computer. And Kasparov and Topolov are going to play a chess game, and they're going to use the computers to help. Because there's something, and I was reading this article uh, last night, and it really got my attention, the way it was describing how all of this came down. The article said that, and I think it's actually part of a book written about this, the article said that the computer used what it called brute force. You've heard that term before, right? Do you know what it means? 
You're fixing to find out. Computer use brute force. And here's, here's how computers do. Computers are nothing the way they are right now. They're nothing but logic. Remember, computers operate on binary code, zeros and ones, a switch being on or a switch being off. And that's it. You, the co computer can display colors on the screen, but the computer can't go, wow, those are really nice colors. Can't do that. Doesn't have that ability. It doesn't have the emotions, the feelings. There was a word that I was reading about Kasparov and about Topolov and all these other chess players. Chess players, human chess players, have a limited ability to think a few moves in advance. But that's about as far as they can go. Can they be beaten by a computer simply by using raw logic? Well, the answer is yes. But there's something that humans have that computers don't have. It's called intuition, um, gut feelings, hair standing up on the back of your neck, or however you want to describe it. Hum computers see the logical move, and that's what they're going to make. Humans might see a logical move, but they also may also see a move that, while it doesn't make logical sense, there's a feeling in a sense among the chess players that this is the right move to make, and they figured they could probably outmaneuver the computer by use of intuition, but they knew that intuition or feelings alone wouldn't win the game, because that's what Kasparov, he, Kasparov was using all of the accumulated knowledge of every chess game he had ever played, different people who had different ways of doing things, and a good chess person, a grandmaster, would, uh, would learn his enemy and learn his enemy's moves and learn how his enemy does things, and so it's like poker players. You look, learn how to read somebody else's face to see what hand they've got. That's what Kasparov was good at. So Kasparov decides to take a computer. Topolov decides to take a computer. Remember, Kasparov had already beat Topolov four to nothing. Okay, four games to none. They both played with Kasparov, Topolov, using the aid of the computer's logic added to the intuition, which is primarily a feminine quality. All humans have it. But females, women, tend to have more of it and operate more so on it than do men. I mean, let me break this down. I've talked about this before. Uh, God designed men and women different, <laughs> in case you haven't wondered. Uh, men, we have this low voice, and we have strength, and we have brute force. Okay, We th tend to think more logically, black and white, on and off, things like that. Women tend to think more creatively with a little bit more passion, a little bit more feelings, with a little bit more intuition. My wife, over the years, God has used my wife to help me uh, in my life and in our ministry. God has used my wife. My wife would say about somebody, hey, um, I don't like that person. And I would go, the logical me would be going, there's nothing wrong with that person. That person is fine. And my wife would say, I, I'm telling you, there's just something about him. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I think you ought to be careful. She did that with a guy one time years ago. She, she was right. And I was going, that is not logical. Okay, that does not compute. And my wife is going, I'm just telling you, I don't like them. I think you ought to watch out for them. She was right. Okay? Not, n intuition and feelings are not always right. They should be subject to logic. But remember, when God created Adam, God created Adam, this... He's, and Adam's brain, you can tell. God sends all the animals to him. He's naming all the animals just like that. Hey, you're a cat. You're a dog. You're a horse. You're a hippopotamus. Okay? He's doing that. His brain's amazing. Okay? But God said it's not good that the man should be alone. I'll send a help meet to him. Remember Adam 2.0 last week? We're going to bring him in on the scene in this new sub-series. I call it Singularity's Temple. Anyway. So here's what, here's what Kasparov and the computer and Topolov and the computer are doing. Kasparov is using the computer's logical functions to determine what course of action that they might possibly take would be the best one. But then Kasparov is using his knowledge over the years 
of how chess is really played in the real world and using intuition and gut feeling and and I know this is a logical one but that's the one they're expecting me to make and so I'm going to override that and do this one. You know how it ended up? They tied three to three. Three games apiece. They couldn't beat one another. Here, now here's a guy that Kasparov had already beaten him four times in, this, in the same match, four times in a row, four to nothing. But now all of a sudden, and here's what they found out, that Topolov was actually better at working the computer and coming up with uh, the correct move. He was actually better at it than Kasparov was. But here's what happened. Here's why I'm bringing all this. And uh, I remembered that I had studied this. I was doing a Pastor Mike online. You may have seen that or something pop into my head. And I went, wait a minute. I got to write this down for the watchman. And I wrote it down. And I did uh, put together the research just last night on this thing because I felt like it was significant comparing, or comparing where we're going with this thing, where we're going with technology, where we're, wh what is the singularity all about. It's about bringing everything into the one. Don't forget that because that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed with this series. This is where we're headed as a species. Because here's what, here's what Kasparov literally invented. I'm sure it had been done other places, but here's what Kasparov and Topolov set forth. It was the first ever publicly played game of what they called centaur chess. Dun, dun, dun. You know what a centaur is? Here's a picture of it. In fact, here's a graphic of Kasparov, the mighty muscle man, with a horse's body and a chessboard. You see down there uh, below that some great mighty warrior fighting a centaur. A centaur is, ready, half human, half beast. And some of you are going, oh, yeah, like Baphomet. Remember Baphomet? Half human, half animal, half human, half winged angel beast, like cherubims are in Ezekiel chapter 1. The combination of a human being combining his efforts with that of a computer, the computer's logic and speed and processing power and the human's intuition. You have the masculine and the feminine just like... Here, the double eagle, masculine and feminine, together in one body. You can use a centaur, you can use a double eagle, you can use a square and compass, you can use all sorts of imagery and, and symbolisms and end up with the same principle. The computer plus the human can do more than they can separately. I want you to get that idea. The computer cannot have intuition and feelings and emotions. You remember Data on Star Trek. Data is, he's all computer, he's all logic. He cannot use uh, verbal contractions like can't and ain't. Can't do it, he's all logical. What does he want to do? Little Pinocchio wants to become a human. He wants to have, he wants to be a perfect human by having logic and the brain power that he has plus the emotions that all the other humans have. He wants to be able to tell a joke and make it funny and laugh along with it. That's what he wants. We're, we're progressing as a species. We're developing the computers and we're gearing ourselves up to join with them. There are things computers cannot do. They need us to do for them. We're doing that right now. There are things that we cannot do that we're wanting the computer to do for us. Stephen Hawking is another of the brains of the world that has decided that artificial intelligence will not be the greatest thing since sliced white bread to ever occur to planet Earth. He's warning everybody, if we develop artificial intelligence, the computers will outdo us humans and pour us will probably be eliminated. It won't turn out very good for us. And so um, we're, the idea, I think, that's going to develop over the years. Here we have Elon Musk of, I um, can't remember what company he runs, and then Stephen Hawking. And some of these other noted people, noted brains of the earth, are telling us uh, we developed the AI. We just better pack our bags because 
we're fixing to be an extinct species. They're going to do away with us. Remember iRobot, the movie? That's where everybody thinks we're headed. So here's what I think is going to go down. I think with all of these warnings coming out, and we've seen all the movies, how it turns out bad, right? What if instead of just developing artificial intelligence alone, what if along with developing artificial intelligence, we develop a way that the artificial intelligence in the computers needs us and we need them, thus becoming centaurs, hybrids. Kasparov and Topolov plays a hybrid chess game. The computer and the human facing off against the computer and the human. And there's chess matches going on all over the world right now where that exact same thing is done. And so each part does what the other cannot do. It's called symbiosis. Now, you heard me talk about that. The article way back in 1960 that talked about man and machine symbiosis, like the fig tree that needs this certain little insect uh, to pollinate itself, but this insect can only live on this particular fig tree. They need each other. They can't get along without each other. It's kind of like, you know, couples husbands and wives and so on, even they may fight every now and then, but they realize they need each other and they can't get along without each other. That is symbiosis. Now we're approaching a symbiosis, a centaurism of man and machine. In fact, it's already, it's already taking place because last night I was putting these thoughts together and I was preparing my, my PowerPoint slides and I was looking for, of course, number one, I, I was looking for an image that had Gary Kasparov and a centaur in it, and I found that one, okay? So then I wanted a picture of just a centaur, something with, you know, man and human, it didn't have Kasparov in it. So I went to Google Image Search, and I typed in centaur. The first picture that came up, on the screen, you know, it gives you all these pictures. First one that came up on the screen was based upon the previous search that I had done on Google. And you say, well, yeah, it, it remembered that. No, it's more than that. Google is amassing all of this data on us. Um, I'm deciding to be a little bit more careful about using Google Chrome because I'm doing a little Christmas shopping on my Chrome browser. Google owns it, which basically means everything you do on there, they're going, they're writing it down. Okay, he went to that website. Okay, he clicked that. He did that. His mouse hovered over this for about 2.1 seconds. They, and they, they put all that down. That's information that they have on you. So I'll go to Drudge Report the next day. There's advertisements there of some of the things I was shopping for the previous day. And I've said this before. I bought some things at Amazon.com, had them shipped here, and lo and behold, I get on Drudge Report last night, and they're trying to sell me the same junk I bought the day before. I'm going, okay, they're getting a little smarter, but they're not quite there yet, or they'd have known I, already, I don't need that. You don't have to advertise it to me. I already got it. Okay? But here, we're, we're already becoming a centaur-based society because I wanted a picture of a centaur and Google's machine, there wasn't a guy on the other end going, uh, hey, Mike Hoggard's looking for a picture of a centaur. You want us to put the Kasparov picture up there? There's nobody did that. Nobody can. I mean, you know how many people are on the internet, right? I think there's more people on the internet than people on the planet. But anyway, you know, it's a computer program that does this. The computer learns me. It learns what I'm wanting. That's how Google got as big as they got. They were beating Yahoo. They've been doing this since day one. Google decided to be smart about the searches and not dumb. Google is massing all this information. And Google can pretty much determine the more you use them, Google learns you. And it learns what you're looking for. And it provides it for you so that you don't have to do a lot of work. We're already 
on the road to becoming centaurs. Now Google, Google search is a combination. Google has all the logic, we have all the feelings. I, I look at the pictures of things that I want and I don't just take the first most logical one. I'm looking for something that I think looks cool or looks neat or whatever it is. See, there's my intuition, there's my feelings, there's my sense of artistic impression. Right now, computers don't have that. They need us to supply it. We need them to scan the internet looking for the right pictures. So again, think about this concept. Male, female, yin and yang, sons of God, daughters of men. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. It's almost like a symbiotic relationship that you see taking place in the book of Daniel. And I think that's where we're going with all of this because humans have the intuition, which is a feminine trait. They kept describing computers and how they play chess as computers using what they called brute force. When I read that, immediately my mind began spinning in gear because that word, brute, you know what it comes from? Some of you are going, yeah, Brutus and Popeye. Why was Brutus called Brutus and Popeye? Why was he? Okay, at first he was called Bluto. I don't know where he got that from. Then they changed it to Brutus. Why did they call him that? The word brute, B-R-U-T-E, there's a deodorant called that too. Brute means beast-like in their thinking. Let me describe that, okay? Animals do not possess, I'm going to hurt somebody's feelings here in a little bit. Animals do not possess a soul like human beings do. God did not breathe into their nostrils the breath of life and, and they became a living soul. God did not do that. Animals operate upon instinct. We call it instinct. Why? Because there are certain things in an animal's DNA that are hardwired in there that they just don't overcome. They just don't. You can't train certain traits out of animals. You can't do it. There are certain things about them that are instinctive to them. It's already been programmed. It's all simple logic to them. They're just doing what they're told to do. Every year, us fellas here at Bethel, we go out into the woods, we try to grow a beard a little bit, we go out into the woods in November. Why November? Because we know in November the buck, deers, and the does simply cannot override their programming. Does go in estrus, bucks know that, they smell that. You see three or four does running across the field, count to ten. There's going to be a buck or two right behind her, right on her tail. We know this. Why? Because they do this every year. Why do they do it? Because that's what their programming tells them to do. It's hardwired in them. They're like computers. that can. They are limited to certain things. Deer don't love us. Why would they? But we certainly love deer. Now, I'm going to say this like this. I, I, deer are beautiful. I love to, I mean, we see them on the side of the road all the time. And every time we see a deer somewhere, we stop and look. Okay? We're not automatically just smacking our lips. I think they're beautiful creatures. I also think they're tasty, too. Okay? So while I kind of love and appreciate deer, they don't appreciate me. In fact, God hardwired into them a fear of man. Your pet dog, your pet dog, who you think loves you and is loyal to Yeah, loyalty's inbred in there. I get that. I, God showed me that one day. We had a little dog, and that dog came and sat down. It wandered through the house, and it came and sat down right at my feet. And the Holy Ghost was gone. Mike, see that? See that? That's wired into that dog. That dog is submitting itself to your feet, and that's where, that's where it chose to lay down at, at your feet. That dog is your servant. Okay? She was wired to do that. It's in her DNA. It's in her binaries and her bits and her bites. It's in her DNA to be exactly the way she is. If I were to die in the house, nobody found my body for three or four days, that dog would eat me. Why? It's what she's coded to do. Hardwired that way. So when they were describing Deep Blue as using brute force, to make these chess moves, immediately I thought the word fits because animals 
can only think a certain way. Angels, a lot of angels that you see in the Bible, in the book of uh, Ezekiel, in the book of Daniel chapter 7, the four beasts that uh, Daniel sees, those are angels that are of the angelic order. They're cherubs. Lucifer is the anointed cherub. He is the dragon, which means he is a beast, which means he has a nature that he cannot escape. He cannot choose to go around his nature. We can. We can. We have a nature. We have this animal tendency to us that wants to go out and break the God's laws and do all kinds of creepy things. But we've got decision-making processes that say, you know what, I know this is what my body's telling me to do, but I'm not doing it. Why? Well, that might hurt some people that I love and some people that I care about. I'm, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be any part of that. I don't want that to happen. Bingo. You see the difference now? Humans don't just have brute force. We've got a part of us that makes decisions based upon feelings and emotions, not just pure logic. There have been some things that I felt like was the logical, righteous, holy thing to do. But I felt like that maybe a better decision would be to do something different. And if you think God hates that, re let me remind you that God looked at Adam, the logic, and said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I'll make him a help. And God make the woman the weaker vessel. You go through all through the scriptures. Either for good or for evil, it's been a woman that has helped the man make the decisions. Esther did. Esther did. Jezebel did. Herodias did. Sarah did. The church does. Every time somebody in the body of Christ prays to the Lord Jesus Christ, we usually pray crying. Our emotions, our feelings, our, our, we, we, we can't overcome, so we're weak. And we beg our Lord and our future husband, Jesus Christ, and say, Jesus, will you do this for me? And Jesus doesn't do the logical thing. He does the love thing. Isn't it cool? I, I love this. I love this. But here, here's where I'm going with this. You say, Pastor, I don't know about all this. Brute force and beast and angels. Where do you get that from? King James Bible. You ready? You ready? In fact, I didn't even have to look up the word brute in a dictionary, which I normally do. I go to etymology online, and I find out where the word came from. It's, I think it comes from this Latin thing. I looked it up in the King James Bible. You ready? Two places in your Bible, the Bible will define the word brute for you, and in both places, it's describing. Where are you? Where are you? Here you are. It's describing false prophets and false teachers of the last days. Let's look at it. 2 Peter 2.12. But these, as natural brute beasts, Made to be taken and destroyed. Think of the sacrificial system in the law. Speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Jude said it the same way. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beast in those things they corrupt themselves. Now let's look at these verses here for just a couple minutes. We're going to move on. We're going to look at the significance of the brute beast computers and why we shouldn't mingle with them. All right? But anyway, the false prophets and false teachers characterize as natural brute beasts. They are they're made to be taken and destroyed and they will be. God promised it. And they speak evil of things that they understand not. How can, why is it they don't understand it? Because they think like animals. Animals only know instinctive things. They only know they can be trained and they use things by experience. But when it comes to things related to man or like I say your dog, if you, you're dead in there four days, your dog's not going to go, I'm hungry but I can't eat her. I love her. She took good care of me. That dog's not going to do that. He doesn't understand that. He's a beast. And there are people behind pulpits right now. Brute beasts. And they speak evil of things that they understand not. You get it? What is it? What is it? You were at the church 
and you wanted to use the King James, and the pastor knew about it, and so he decided to get up and preach a message on why you shouldn't use the King James Bible. And you know what one of his points was? We, nobody understands that book. That's hard to understand. Bingo! Brute beast. He speaks evil of things that he doesn't understand. Why doesn't he understand it? Because he's a brute beast. He doesn't get it. He's going to perish in his own corruption. Peter said it. Jude said it. And they're corrupt in doing so. So now the Bible's just, it's giving you the connection. Computers operate on brute force, pure logic, zeros and ones, bits and bytes. Do the programming and that's it. The humans have a feeling side, an intuitive side, an emotional side, a, a, dis, a, a side that can kind of deceive a little bit. Did you, you realize that most sporting events that we watch, the play of sporting events are based upon deception? Footballers in a huddle, okay? The catcher giving signs to the pitcher that we don't want the other guys to know, and then there's the manager down in the, um, down in the bullpen going, Okay, well, you know what that is? It's meant to show that person what they want and we're trying to deceive everybody else. There are deceptive plays in just about every game that there is. Humans can do that. Beasts can't do that. Kasparov can, can use deceptive plays in his chess game. He can make you think that he's doing this and when he sees you going after it, then he's going to come around from behind and get your queen, and then he's going to put you in checkmate, all right? So you understand the concept. It's, if you've heard of some supercomputer somewhere called the beast, that's why they called it that, because that is exactly what it is. It only does what its instincts and its DNA tells it to do. That's all it does. That's all it knows. And in the... Singularity. I really think that the computer world and the human world are going to realize we need each other and merge. Sons of God, daughters of men, they, the Iron Kingdom. Think about that. Why is it iron? Iron doesn't change. It doesn't move. It's hard. Think about it. Brute force. That's what iron is. Clay, we're made out of clay. What can you do with clay? Well, you can make little snowmen, you can make little puppets, you can make little doggies, or you can make snakes out of it. You can do whatever you want to with it. Do you see that? Do you see the, the, the connection here? Daniel chapter 2 with this idea of brute force, beasts, computers, and soft humans joining together. They're going to try it. God said it won't work. It won't stand. Let's look at how that word brute and that concept is used in the scriptures. You're going to get it. Psalm 92, verse 6. A brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. You see the language of the scriptures. Brutish men, animal brain men, don't know anything. Fools don't understand. Proverbs 30, verse 2. Surely I am more brutish than any man and have not the understanding of a man. That sounds like what a computer would say of itself. Google is trying to learn us, but it can't quite. You see, I put in the word centaur after I'd already found a picture of Gary Kasparov. And the computer's trying to figure me out. So when I typed in centaur, it put the Kasparov picture first. That's not the one I picked, but that's the one they thought that I should pick. You see it? That's not the one I got. I got a different one, one that I could imagine in my mind that I wanted. There was a ton of pictures, that, but I picked one that was way down on the list, and Google would probably say, I wonder why he picked that one. Maybe I need to learn more about Mike Hoggard. No, I don't know that you can learn how I think and how I feel and how things look to me. I don't think computers can do that without being merged with humans. That's what I think is going to happen. Jeremiah 10, 14. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder. Now look at it. Now we're bringing in the false prophet idea of building an image 
to the beast. Every founder is confounded by the graven image. For his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. There's no soul. Jeremiah 10, 21. For the pastors are become brutish. That, stop right here. That goes exactly with what we were, what we were learning from, um, from uh, First Peter, or excuse me, Second Peter, and from the book of Jude, that these false teachers and false prophets are natural, brute beasts, speaking evil of things that they understand not and made to be taken and destroyed. He says, for the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper and all their flocks shall be scattered. Ezekiel 12, 31. And I will pour out mine indignation upon thee. I will blow against thee in the fire of my wrath and deliver thee into the hand of brutish men and skillful to destroy. Look at what God said. God said that he would pour out his indignation. That's his wrath. The fire of his wrath. Think of kindle fire. Deliver thee unto the, into the hand of what kind of men? Beast men. Brutish men, skillful to destroy. Think of leopards and lions and cheetahs. Cheetahs know how to run down an antelope and kill it. In fact, that's pretty much all they're good at. They're skillful at it. What was Nimrod? He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. He may not have been able to crochet anything or draw a nice picture, but he knew how to kill. He knew how to kill. Brutish. So think of the concept of man and beast. There are things that animals can do that we cannot do. There are diseases that animals don't get that we get. Spirits as well. These, these devils that are in the angelic realm are nothing more than beasts. They have a beast nature. They cannot override it. They cannot choose their way around it. They're doing what they are programmed to do, and at some point, the connection between the computer world and the spiritual world, which I haven't made yet, I don't quite see the connection, but I can see where all of these paths are leading, both man and the spiritual world, I, and Daniel chapter 2, and man and the computer world that we see all around us. Both of them, at some point, I'm going to look at something, or you're going to see it, and you're going to say, Mike, there it is, right there. You see that? And I'm going to go, yep, that's, this is that which is spoken by the prophets. So anyway, you have this concept now that, um, that the computers need us. We're going to realize we need the computers because we're being warned that uh, just the artificial intelligence of brute beasts is not something that we want to do. So I think that, and, and I'm going to show you this in today and, and next week's Watchmen, I'm going to show you the connection between, get it, the connection between humans and computers, okay? We need an RS-232 port somewhere in our armpit so we can plug the printer up, okay? I don't think it's going to look quite that way nor be as painful, but we're working on technology to fuse man and technology or man and computer uh, man and these brute beasts of computers together. We're working on it right now. I kept mentioning last week, kept mentioning Adam 2.0, the new Adam, this idea of a, of a, of a supercomputer being built by man. Man's the God. Man is creating the supercomputer that can think like men and be smarter than men and so on. And I want you to think of this. This, this new Adam, this new deep blue, deeper blue computer, whatever it is, every god needs a place to live, and it needs a wife. Every one of them. You go through all the mythology. Zeus had a wife. Okay, uh, This god over here had a wife. Usually, they were human. So I think... It, and I'll read some scriptures here in a little bit, but think of Christ and his church. We'll see that in scripture. You'll see the connection here. So I think once we build this new Adam, once we build this brute force computer that thinks as we do, only way better, 
I think at that point, and that's what Ray Kurzweil is predicting, that when it gets to that point, we will have figured out a way to merge ourselves with that machine. Okay? Think of what Lucifer said in Isaiah 14, I will be like the Most High. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at some scriptures that show us God's plan for man, Christ and his church, Christ and his temple. And we're going to see, we're going to flip it over because the devil says, I will be like the Most High. He's going to copy God in what he does. He said that in Ezekiel 28. I am God. I sit in the seat of God, though thou art a man. 2 Thessalonians 2. He is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This new God, however he turns out to be, is going to need a place to live in. He's going to need a house to dwell in. He's going to need a temple where he can be worshipped, because that's what the Bible says. Now, I'm going to bring a couple ideas together. This idea of the centaur chess computer human symbiosis thing, where the human joined with the computer because the computer needed the human and the human needed the computer or loved the computer or whatever sick thing it is. We're going to go in that direction and look at that. I remember because I used to watch Star Trek a lot. Okay, I wasn't a, there's two different kinds of people. There's Trekkies and Trekkers. There's three kinds of people. Trekkies, Trekkers, and people who go you people are weird. Okay, that's three kinds of people. Trekkies are people who watch Star Trek and, and know a lot about it and they, they like it. Trekkers are people who go to Star Trek conventions dressed up like Klingons. Okay, with the makeup and everything. Those are Trekkers. Okay, they're, they're out there. All right. But I remembered... 19, uh, 1976, 77, 78, somewhere around in there. They were, uh, the Star Wars was come, had come out, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Of, so there was a sort of a, a, a transformation in film in, this, in the late 70s because of the advanced special effects by Douglas Trumbull and others and uh, George Lucas. They figured out they can do more things with special effects. So now we're sort of looking at some of the special some of the better made space-based movies. Gene Roddenberry, who was, he hated religion, hated Jesus Christ. I think he was a Freemason. I'm not sure, but I think I read that somewhere. They were going to do a reboot of Star Trek from the 60s. Okay, William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy and all these things. They had conceived of a couple things. Number one, a motion picture or a reboot of the series. They're going to put the series back on, on TV. Well, that never happened, but they had already written some scripts for some, for some episodes of this new uh, Star Trek TV show. The, the, the pilot episode of the new Star Trek series in the 70s, the first one was going to be called In Thy Image. Think about it. That goes all the way back to uh, Genesis. Okay, in the image of God made he him, male and female created he them. It's talking about let us make man in our image after our likeness. So the idea was in thy image. And it was about, this is what eventually they, they scrapped the idea of having a TV show and they just put all their focus and money into a movie, a full feature film, Star Trek the Motion Picture. If you've not seen it, some say it's like the worst one. Star Trek II is the best. Anyway, uh, but anyway, the, I, what they did was they had, I don't know how many scripts written and nobody liked it. And finally, they pulled the pilot episode of this TV series and they said, let's develop that. And here's what it was. Here's what the Enterprise finds out. Um, there is this massive space thing that's coming toward Earth. They send the Enterprise out there with... Uh, Captain Kirk and Spock and Bones and Scotty and all of those other guys out there. They send it out there and a, and a new guy named Captain Decker, okay, who gets demoted. But anyway, they find this massive space thing traveling through space. They don't know what it is. It destroys every ship that ever comes in contact with it. They do a little investigation. This, this massive space thing takes over a female that's on the Enterprise. Her name is Ilea. 
she's bald headed. Okay. Anyway, it takes over her, takes everything out of her that was human or so they thought and replaced it with what they found out was this massive pure logic computer, this humongous computer machine floating through space. They end up being able to go to the core of the computer where the central processor was. They figured if we can disable that, well, then we can beat this thing. They found out that what it was was Voyager. You remember that? We sent this little space computer up into space to travel beyond the solar system to gather intelligence about everything that it could. And the theory was that some super computer race found this thing, saw its programming, enhanced it, and sent it out through the universe to collect information, and that's exactly what it did. What was it doing at Earth? It kept trying to send this radio frequency, which by the 23rd century wasn't used anymore, kept trying to contact Earth and was wondering why they couldn't hear anything from Earth. The computer, through the woman, was saying, we need the Creator. We need the Creator. We need to join with the Creator. Now, this is the machine telling the humans, we need to join with the Creator. Once... Bones and Spock and Kirk, um, once they figured out what was going on, they said, well, it needs to merge with the Creator. We don't know how to do this. Captain Decker steps up. Here's the, here's the image right here. The woman that you see, the bald head, she's the computer. Decker's the human. And he already kind of has the hots for Ilea anyway. So he says, I'll do it. And the final scene of this movie is, and they call it like a new birth, okay? Something new has been born, something new has... Why? Because these two opposites, the creation, pure logic, and the creator, man, needed to join together. And of course, what happens when man and woman join together? There's a birth. Think of Novus Ordo Seclorum, a new world order. I remembered that, and I went, that was an odd episode or odd thing to make a movie about, but that's what they made it, and that's what's going to happen. This is the concept now that we're looking at. Ray Kurzweil, here's a quote of what he said. This is the story of the destiny of the human machine civilization, a destiny we have come to refer as the singularity. He's not saying humans and machines living side by side. He's saying human machines. That's the singularity. I really think this is where we're going. I think this is where we're headed. We're looking at the concept of the, of the computer becoming, becoming a god. Now we're looking at joining the creation, the created god, which man's been doing for thousands of years, joining the created god with human beings. And remember, Lucifer says, um, I will be like the Most High. So what we see in God's realm, I think we flip it upside down. I think that that's exactly where we're headed. Genesis chapter 2. Here's what God said. I've been quoting this, but now we're going to read it. Genesis 2.18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. And let's stop right here. Um, everybody knows men and women are different. There are things about my wife. She thinks differently than I do. She sees things differently than I do. I see things differently than she does. She needs me. I need her. Even sometimes we don't get along every now and then. Okay, I'm in a bad mood. She's in a bad mood. Whatever. But we need each other. I don't want to live without her. She doesn't want to live without me. Okay. God looked at me and he says, it's not, Mike, it's not good that you should be alone. I'm going to make somebody to help you. It's going to help you in life. It's going to help you... Uh, get along down the road. It's going to help you in the ministry. It's going to help you in every way possible. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have kids and grandkids but for my wife. God knew what he was doing. So think of this prototype, Christ. Christ is the man. He's the last Adam. The Bible's telling you that. God says it's not good that he's alone. I will make and help meet for him. You know what meet means? Complete him. 
satisfy him. Um, do things that he cannot do. It's going to be sufficient for his needs. That's what I'm going to do for him. That's what God did for Adam. That's what God is doing for uh, Christ, his son, right now. In Genesis 2.21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. 1 Corinthians 11.8, For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Genesis 2.23, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And now we're going to have Paul explain what this is all about. And I want you to think of this in terms of the God that has been created by man, now going back to man to join with mankind. Ephesians 5.31 For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. That's a singularity. He said this is a great mystery but I speak concerning Christ and the church. I want you to notice that he used the word mystery here, and he says one flesh. That's a singularity. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So we have Christ and his church. That's all of those who have been born again. Those are the, the, the believers in Christ. Okay, um, Christ and his church. The opposite of that is Antichrist, his consort, his Shekinah, is all of humanity. That's his Frankenstein's bride, as it were. Okay, that is the um, the church is the pure, virtuous virgin wife. The world is the harlot wife. And I want you to think of the use of that word mystery. Paul said, this is a great mystery, but I speak of Christ and his church. By the way, the translation, the rapture, is characterized as a mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. We should not all sleep. We should all be changed in a moment, the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Now think of someone, a harlot, whose name is mystery. There she is, Revelation 13, or Revelation 17, mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. Now I want you to think, here again, Christ and his church, which is all of us humans who believe. The Antichrist can't have the believers. He can't have the pure wife. He gets the harlot wife, mystery Babylon. This is everybody in the world that doesn't believe. And they are going to join together. Of that I have absolutely no doubt. Paul referenced that 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Take a look at it. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. You see how he connected it together. The bride, the body, the temple. Christ dwells in and with the bride, the body, and the temple. This is why we should not be appointed to fornication. But then we have the harlot. And he didn't say this particular man joined. He said he which is joined to an harlot is one body. For two saith he shall be one flesh. The singularity. That's what it is. It's when the man of sin, the son of perdition, it's the God that we made joining with his harlot bride, Shekinah his bride, his body, his temple. 
Isn't that what the scriptures are telling us? Okay, so we have this concept of man joining himself with his God that he created, this image that he made. Jeremiah 50, verse 5. They shall ask the way to Zion with their faces thitherward, saying, Come and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. 1 Corinthians six seventeen. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. You see the, the language here. In Jeremiah 50, they're prophesying. They're going to they're gonna say, Come let us join ourselves to the Lord, just like a husband and a wife, Christ and his church. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. We have a, my wife and I, even though we have separate ideas and separate ways to look at things, we have one spirit. We are joined together. We have one spirit. When it comes to our children, we love them all, all both of us. When it comes to our, our families and, and, and our church and everything like that, God literally has given us one spirit just like husband and wife should have, all right? But then you have the Antichrist joining with his people. Numbers 25.3, And Israel joined himself with Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Psalm 106.28, They joined themselves also unto Baal Peor and ate the sacrifices of the dead. Notice they joined with Baal Peor. Baal the Antichrist, the beast, the ox, the golden calf, literally, literally in the wilderness, when Moses took the golden calf, what did he do with it? He stamped it into a very small powder, put it in their water, and made them join with it. Literally, they, the God that they made was dwelling inside of them in the form of that gold powder. Hosea 4.17, Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So, there's the scripture, undeniable idea. The opposite of Christ and his bride is the antichrist and the harlotry of all mankind. Those who just decided, I'd rather have the devil than God. They turned the temple of God into a house of idols. They fused light and darkness. God said, you're not supposed to do that. That's what's going on. Man joining himself in this context of the singularity. Man joining himself with this computer God that he's building to become one, the singularity. That's what Kurzweil was getting at. We're all going to join together poof, on this one big explosive day when the computer technology is going to become so smart that literally, and you ought to see how they describe this, literally everything in the world, every law, every system of government, every religious idea and concept is going to change just like that. Can you imagine... I mean, it's hard to explain this technology to old people that are still alive. Can you imagine going back a hundred years, describing how we got to the moon, describing the internet, describing what email is, describing, describing um, watching um, movies on our tablets and listening to, uh, listening to music being streamed through the airwaves into our tablets? Can you, can you imagine trying to describe for somebody how computers work a hundred years ago, they never even conceived of that. But we have evolved into it. So I'm going to take a few minutes and just a little bit of time remaining here, and I'm going to take you up to a point. I'm going to show you how we got to the point where we are now of mixing man and machine, but where it's going after that. We'll probably discuss that next week. So take a look at this. Remember this, 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 uh, this paper, this thesis that was written in 1960, Man and Computer Symbiosis. The quotation was, the hope is that in not too many years, human brains and computing machines will be coupled together very tightly. That's like cleaving to one another. And that the resulting partnership will think as no human brain has ever thought 
and process data in a way not approached by the information handling machines we know today. Again, that was 1960. Let's move forward a few years. Now we have a breakthrough in the year 2000. And people and conspiracy theories have talked about this for, I think Mark B is going to be a computer chip, RFID chip. That was the start. Okay, that was the start. I, I, I think it's way beyond that. But that was the start. Because we had a company called Digital Angel. That's what they were called, Digital Angel. You see the graphic here. And the little, you know, rice, grain of rice size RFID chip that would be implanted in human beings. It looks sort of painful to have all those wires stuck in us and stuff like that. I had to go back in the archives because I remembered what they were promoting when they came out with Digital Angel, the microchip that goes inside of human beings. I remembered what they said. I had to go back and find this. Digital Angel, this is what they promoted, will be a connection from yourself to the electronic world. It will be your guardian your protector like angels. It will bring good things to you. We will be a hybrid of electronic intelligence and our own what? Soul. I think there was a spirit guiding him, guiding this technology. So it goes from a, th a thought and a theory on paper, 1960, 40 years later, the year 2000, now a company is making this rudimentary chip that's going inside people's skins. And of course, in two, I remember in 2000, we were all going, that's the mark of the beast. They're going to put it in your hand. Look at they're putting it in your hand. It's the mark of the beast. We already look back 14 years later and go, boy, that thing. I mean, we just, just take a look at it, okay? We're going, boy, talk about old technology, okay? That's like, that's like going to a yard sale, opening up this big case and you find a manual typewriter in there, and your kid goes, what's that? Well, you know what that is? That's, a, that's the word processor. We used to put paper in there and type things, and kids are going, really? That's how you did it back then? That's what that chip is to us. We look at that and going, yeah, I remember that. We all thought that was the mark of the beast, and we were ready for the rapture any minute. 14 years later, that's old technology, but the concept is the same. Man-computer symbiosis, we're figuring it out, we're trying to figure out the way to finally merge man with machine. You see, even though they put the chip inside of us, it didn't really do anything to us. People had that chip implanted in there, and everybody's going, that's it, you're at the mark of the beast. But the guy's going around, yeah, I got a chip in me. It's no big deal. We put it in our dogs all the time now. They chip dogs, so, you know, stray dogs, they know who it is. Doesn't change the dog. Doesn't make him, make him want to bow down and worship, you know, this image. Doesn't change them anyway. It's just like a, like a piece of shrapnel stuck under your skin. That's all it is. So that wasn't it. That wasn't it. It's not going to be it. But it was the great, great, great grandfather of it. All right? So let's move forward a little bit, all right? Then, then, I didn't see this back in the 90s. There was a company. Here it is. It's called Singular Wireless. You remember them? You remember them? Singular Wireless. Kind of makes sense. See, I didn't know what singular meant back then. But now I get it. Singularity. Same concept. This is before Ray Kurzweil, I think, came up with it. So the concept was around before Kurzweil of a singularity where man and machine was going to merge. And what was singular? It was a wireless, a, a mobile phone company promoting the concept of man and machine together all the way back then, raising the bar. That's like a Freemasonic term. You're going up a level. We're evolving more and more. You see their logo? See that X with the, with the dot on it? That's the pentagram. That's what it is. And, and basically, we've talked about this before. Manley Hall says the pentagram, this little symbol here of the, of the X with the dot on it, is basically the four elements with the fifth element, ether, rising up out of it. That's elemental witchcraft. That's what it is. And that was their logo. 
And I think witchcraft and, and the elements, and the elements I think represent the four base pairs of your DNA. So absolute, and the X chromosome, absolutely. They're mingling themselves with the single seed of men. That is what's going to become the singularity. I, I, I kind of go back to again and look at this. They have this big flame ball flying through the air. 3G, you know what that was? That was a data plan that you got back in the late 90s, in the early 2000s. That was a data plan you got. High-speed internet, 3G. Now we're 4G. And we look at 3G and we're going, eh. I go to Kenya, okay? And uh, I say, can we get internet? Yeah, you get it on the phone. Oh, yeah, really? He said, yeah, it's 3G. Oh, 3G, ah, that'll do. Guess I can send an email to my wife or... You know, maybe this pixelated, you know, video feed or whatever. But now we're 4G. Now, now they've developed 5G. They're figuring out a way to implement it. And you know what 5G will do? You'll be able to download that movie from iTunes in one second. Five, when we get 5G, we'll be going, boy, this is slow. And you'll think, well, remember when we were 4G? Oh, my goodness. 3G? Oh, man, it took forever. Remember those days? We were working on it, but it wasn't there yet. Let me move along. Then, then, Steve Jobs, the occultist, the transcendental meditationalist, with Apple, the bite out of the Apple computer company, introduces the smartphone. And man is hooked. Nobody's carrying dumb phones anymore except for my father-in-law. He doesn't have a smartphone. He's got a dumb phone. And the reason why I keep saying that is he pulls it out. He says, oh, this dumb phone, I can't get anything out of it. It's funny, okay? iPhones. I have smartphones and tablets like all around me all the time. I don't go anywhere without something in my hand, a tablet or a phone or a smartphone. I mean, it revolutionized everything. So now we have computers. I was going back through my Commodore 64 days, thinking about the old days, back the way we used to do it back in 1984. And I can remember a magazine uh, advertising this Commodore 64 in a big case. It was a Commodore 64 computer that was, uh, that was uh, put into this case and it had this color monitor in there and a floppy disk drive all in one. I wanted one of those so bad, I could, I, I was in college back then, I didn't have the money. I wanted one of those so bad. The ability to carry around a computer everywhere I go. <sighs> I'm in heaven. 1984, I didn't have the money. I can play Commodore 64 games on this iPad. It's got an emulator, okay, or at least on my smartphone. There's a basic programs. I won't get into that anyway. Revolutionary. Revolutionary. Now, now we can carry the computers with us. We don't have to go, well, I, I want to check on this, but I got to get home to my computer so I can look up the information from the bulletin board service. Some of you remember that. We don't do that anymore. I was, uh, where was I? Was, I was eating lunch with my wife yesterday, and we have one of these rewards cards at the, at the restaurant we go to every now and then, and a the card didn't read right. And the lady says, um, are you sure this, are you sure you have an account? This is your card? And we said, yeah, we, we've got like, we got a free hamburger coming here before too long. And I said, wait a minute. I can show you I have an account. I pulled out my phone, pulled up the email that I get from them. And I did a Google search of my email to find the rewards email they sent me, the latest one, and it had my account number. And I said, Here's, here I am right here. And she wrote that number down. She said, yeah, you're in the machine. You're in the system. We got a free milkshake out of it. Not for me. Okay? I don't have to wait to go home to look. I don't have to go to the library to look it up. Got it right there. I carry it everywhere with me. I am, I am a product of this world. I get it. I understand it. Okay? Then we go from, now Apple. Apple's making the iPhone. Now, everybody else has got to get on the scene. Google is really about the only company that survived that can actually do it better than Apple. And the Apple and Google are going back and forth with the Android. You see here the Android phone Alienware. That's a concept phone, by the way. 
but now it's everywhere. Now we got the phones, we're taking pictures, we're listening to music, we're watching movies, we're playing games, we're looking at stocks information, sports scores, the weather, the radar, the forecast, everything. Look up definitions of words. We can find where people are. We can try I track my wife. She tracks me. We have her kids and you know, find friends and all this. We're doing stuff that 20 years ago never thought we'd do. We're doing it now. Can you imagine what it's going to be like another 20 years? Now we have Google Glass. Google Glass. And while some people are making fun of it, I'm just going, I think that's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool. It's like the visor on Geordi on Star Trek. He can see things that nobody else can see. And here you're wearing these pair of glasses, and it's, it's linked with your smartphone with Bluetooth. And it's getting data, and your eyes are connecting to the Internet of everything. And you can see, I mean, take a look at it. You can see maps projected right in front of your eyes. But if you want to, then you can take them off. Yeah, it's time to go to sleep now. I'm just going to pull my Google glasses off because I don't need to know where I'm at right now. So we can take them off right now. But we are slowly but surely developing this symbiosis as we're speaking. We're do you're doing it. You're doing it. I am doing it. Okay, but Google Glass is going to have to take a back seat to something that I talked about this a year ago, and I'm going, why doesn't somebody come up with this? Well, they're doing it. It's called Oculus Rift. I had to think about this for a while. You know why they called it the Rift? I get to the Oculus thing in a minute. You know why they called it the Rift? The Rift is what, uh, the, if you go to Kenya, there's the Rift Valley. It separates eastern Kenya from western Kenya. And they're all up here. And the Rift Valley is this huge low spot in Kenya that you've got to go through to get to the other side. It separates here from here. That's what a rift is. When you, you know, rift your clothes, they rent their clothes all the time in the Bible. They separated things. The Oculus Rift basically realizes that there is right now a rift between humans and machines. The Oculus Rift basically is to bring them one step closer. Take a look at it. Oculus VR. VR means virtual reality. Notice the all-seeing eye here. That's what's on here. Okay, Same symbol, same idea behind it. The singularity is what's symbolized by this all-seeing eye. And that's their logo. Samsung's getting in on the deal. And basically, instead of you looking at your two-dimensional image on your tablet from a distance, you're going to put the thing right here so that you won't see anything else around you except for what is in three dimensions on your, in going into your two eyes. People have described it as, as just anything beyond what we have experienced so far. Virtual reality really being brought into our minds and even uh, was well, Second Life. I used my hand because they've got a little eyeball in, in a hand for their symbol, a mark in their hand for a symbol. Second Life is this fantasy world that people get online and they can be whatever they want to be. They can fly through there, they can be this. If they're ugly, they can be cute or whatever it is. And, and Second Life has already joined hands with this Oculus Rift virtual reality thing, and now people who are on Second Life can put on their virtual reality glasses, and it's as if they're there. It's as real as possible right now. But we're not done. Here is uh, an article that Time put out called How Apple is Invading Our Bodies, and I want you to notice this um, sort of image uh, portrayed upon this guy's skin and the Apple here's the article the Apple watch is very personal personal and intimate were words that Apple CEO Tim Cook and his colleagues used over and over again when presenting it to the public for the first time that's where the watch is likely to change things because it does something computers aren't generally supposed to do it lives on your body it perches on your wrist like one of Cinderella's helpful birds. It gets closer than we're used to technology getting. It, it gets inside your personal bubble. We're used to technology being safely other. But the Apple Watch wants to snuggle up and become part of yourself. To wear a device as powerful as the Apple Watch makes you ever so slightly post-human. 
What might post-humanity be like? The paradox of wearing of a wearable device is that it both gives you control and takes it away at the same time. Consider the watch's fitness applications. They capture all data that your body generates, your heart and activity and so on, and gathers it up and stores and returns it to you in a form you can use. Once the development community gets through apping it, there's no telling what else it might gather. This will change your experience of your body. The wristwatch made the idea of not knowing what time it was seem bizarre. In five years, it might seem bizarre not to know how many calories you've eaten today or what your resting heart rate is. The Apple Watch represents a redrawing of the map that locates technology in one place and our bodies in another. The line between the two will never be as easy to find again. Once you're okay with wearing technology, the only way forward is inward. The next product launch after the Apple Watch would logically be the eye implant. If Apple succeeds in legitimizing wearables as a category, it will have successfully established the founding node in a network that could spread throughout our bodies with Apple setting the standards. Then we'll really have to decide how much control we want and what we're prepared to give up for it. That's a marriage, right? Remember, guys? Remember when you were Mr. Single Man, you did whatever you want to. When I was in college, I was single, and man, I was out there. Man, I could go anywhere in the middle of the night and get me a hamburger or a burrito from 7-Eleven. I could do whatever I wanted to. I'd make my own decision, do my own thing, and then I got married. Where do you want to go today, dear? Remember those days? Oh yeah, it's what we wanted. We wanted the company of a wife. We wanted the blessings and pleasure and love of a wife. But boy, what did we give up to get it? See it? There's a marriage coming. There's a wedding day. It's happening. See, couples, this is how it's supposed to be. Before they're married, they connect on the outside of each other. When they get married, now it's on the inside. That's where we're going. That's the marriage. That's the wedding. That's mankind joining, or the beast joining with his harlot wife, becoming one, the singularity. That's where we are right now. We're going to take a look a little bit at where it's going. We're probably going to wrap this up uh, next, watching the broadcast, and move on to something else. Keep your eyes open. Okay, notice what's going on around you. I gotta go. This is Pastor Mike. We'll see you next time. Adios.